When my mother was around 12 years old, she enrolled in an alternative boarding school, a place that was part of a radical education movement that emphasized unmediated experience over instruction and authority. It was governed by a democratic system that put students and teachers on equal footing. Few were even dating. And the school's primary goal was inspiring students to participate in the running of their own lives. Academics were of secondary importance. Sometimes the math teacher would resolve the issue of grades by just throwing a dart at a dartboard. She met my father, who had been subjected to a very strict elementary school education, and he was the official math whiz kid of Canada with him in his little button-up shirt. He enrolled in university at the age of 14. Neither of my parents had been subjected to the conventional experience of moving from kindergarten through grade 12 and into college in a linear fashion. They decided not to send us to school. My siblings and I slept late, never knew what day of the week it was. We were never tested, we were never graded, so we called ourselves unschoolers. There were not very many unschoolers, though our more known counterparts, the Christian fundamentalist homeschoolers, could be found in abundance. Uh, once we went to a homeschool playgroup, parents organized the kids into a game of religious Fred Rover. Basically, we never went back, and I really don't think they missed us. Unlike those families, our parents weren't trying to limit our exposure to the outside world. Instead, the world was our classroom, and in theory, at least, nothing was off limits. We were different from homeschoolers. We weren't replicating school in the home. We had no textbooks, no class times, no schedules, no deadlines, no tests, no curricula. Instead, our parents encouraged us to cultivate our own unique, usually idiosyncratic interests at our own pace. Are you fascinated by primates, by rocks, baseball cards, whatever you're interested in, go forth. They trusted our curiosity, which is what this whole debate about compulsory education centers on. Do we trust people's capacity to be curious, to be in charge of themselves, to be inquisitive, to follow their own innate desire to investigate, or do we believe people need to be led? Have you ever met anyone who isn't interested in something? Have you ever met someone who is incapable of learning? John Holt, who coined the term unschooling, put it this way. The human animal is a learning animal. We like to learn. We are good at it. We don't need to be shown how or made to do it. What kills the process are the people interfering with it and trying to regulate or control it. So it's a very romantic idea. And so at our house, curiosity and creativity was not regulated or controlled. It was influenced and facilitated. And those are different things. We spent countless afternoons exploring the creeks and woods behind our house, planting gardens that rarely flourished. Some days we read books, we made music, we painted, we drew the star in elaborate homemade movies or bizarre puppet shows. Other days we argued amongst ourselves and fought over the computer. Endless afternoons were spent watching reruns of The Simpsons. We knew every word by heart. And when we weren't that inspired, which was quite often, we did nothing. We were allowed to just do nothing. And for my family, unschooling work. We are all literate. We can all balance a checkbook. And we have all had the opportunity, whether we've taken it or not, to pursue higher education. I'm higher in quotes. If it seems like we're the exception to some rule, we're not. We are the rule. Kids school at home do better on standardized tests. We are typically marvelously well behaved. We get along well with others. Ivy League universities hunt out homeschoolers. In Brown University's alumni magazine, a dean declared homeschoolers to be the epitome of Brown students. They are self-directed. They take risks and they don't back off. One in three American adults believe that politics and government are too complicated to understand. The chances that an American who is homeschooled would agree with that statement are only one in 25. The potential of self-education has been proven time and time again. The question is why most schooling seems geared towards quarantining the experience of learning as opposed to unleashing it. Because isn't that what school does? The subjects are separated from each other as though there's some reason to fear cross-contamination, like English can't touch history or something bad would happen. I tried school, curious how the other 99% lived. I tried fourth grade. I was tormented for not having kid sneakers. Alex went to sixth grade. He was beaten up for calling the two boys who picked on him homo sapiens. These experiences reinforced our sense that staying home was a privilege. We would call kids who went to school school kids, and we wondered, why, why are they so mean? Why are they so aggressive? Why do they hate us? So we knew we were being spared this harassment, and we were also being spared years of absolutely unnecessary and insulting boredom. School acclimates children to boredom so that as adults, they can work long hours at jobs. They won't describe as uneventful, mind-numbing, soul-destroying, in other words, boring. And I'm always stunned when people say to me, weren't you bored at home? I think these people are out of their minds. Schools are factories of restlessness, lethargy, monotony, tedium. Were we bored at home? No. My mom would say, when you're bored, you're boring. This phrase reveals what might be the essence of self-education. You don't have to learn because you'll get in trouble or because you're going to fail a test. You have to learn because you want to. Because there's something in you that wants to reach out and touch the world and want to communicate with it. Think about all those hours of time most kids are forced to waste in boredom at school. Sure, we bickered, we made mud pies, we rode our bikes in circles, but we also got to focus deeply on the things that we really cared about. We liked unschooling, but I was concerned about my future. What became of grown-up unschoolers? I thought I wanted to be a physicist, and even if I could have managed to teach myself hard science, that wouldn't count for much in the outside world. So at 13, I enrolled in ninth grade, and the truth is I was shocked, disappointed even by how fast I came to identify with my public school peers, feeling just as disaffected and trapped as I imagined they must feel. Day after day, I had to remind myself that I was actually choosing to be there. If I had stood up in the middle of a monotonous lecture and just stormed out, my parents would have welcomed me home with open arms. I could have marched past those police officers and they would have said, yeah, school's
a drag. It's like a prison. Come home. They would have been pleased. But even though I had their support, society told me that if I didn't go to college, even if I avoided being ignorant, I would not be accredited. And that frankly seemed like an even more damning fate. It was better to be dumb with a degree. So when I first got to school, I presumed that the other students would be envious of my laid back upbringing. But to my surprise, most of them were absolutely aghast. They would say things like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself all day, or oh, I wouldn't want my mom or my teacher. The majority were incapable of imagining that my mother wasn't my teacher. And that's what was so great about it. We were our own teachers. We were our own teachers. But there were some kids that really got it right away. And I realized that they were trying to cultivate in the school what we already had at home. These were the kids who failed classes, not out of ignorance or indolence, but because of the sheer inanity of it. Public high school was a sociological experiment, an existential adjustment, an extended lesson in procedure, routine, convention. Never before I had asked permission to have a drink of water, go to the bathroom. Never did I have to feign activity and look busy when in fact I was bored and doing nothing important. The academics were a breeze. I was years ahead in math and science and English and history. I was behind in Spanish. But I confess there was a certain pleasure, I found a certain pleasure in handing over my agency and shifting from the ambiguity of unschooling where there are no clear metrics for success to the authoritarian structure of school where I knew that I was doing well by the system's own strange logic. I got kudos daily, not for my brilliance or for my diligence. And I began to see myself reflected in the marks I received, but not the nurturing intellectual community that I craved. I held out for life after graduation, convinced college would be different because that's what they tell you. And so by the time I was 16, I abandoned high school to enroll at the University of Georgia. And then the next year, I went to Brown University in Rhode Island. I was going to the most liberal school in the Ivy League, a place where everyone assured me I would belong. I realized my mistake the first day at Brown when the administrators assembled the entire freshman class in the auditorium. You are all the most smart and capable of your generation, they told us. This is the best place to be, and you are here because you were the best. And I knew that what they were saying wasn't true. I knew that we weren't the smartest or the best. And I had the suspicion that actually we were kind of the cowards of our class. That we were the grade mongers, the brown nosers, the play by the rulers, the approval seekers. We hustled for A's and submitted to the system, doing pointless assignments, building our resumes at the age of 16 and 17. And we were kind of too spineless to rock a boat. So as the semester progressed, I felt even more isolated from the outside world than I had in high school. I was complaining to a friend of my unhappiness. He asked why I was attached to the idea of getting a degree in physics. He said, why? It's not like you do science when you're not in school. His off-the-cuff remark shook me to my core. He was right. I didn't really engage with the material on my own time. Was there anything I loved enough to pursue outside of that framework? Did I even know who I was or what I like to think about anymore? Why had I felt compelled to enroll in an Ivy League school to excel by the standards of compulsory education instead of making my own way? What was I afraid of? My parents thought Brown was a joke. They never seemed impressed. Years later, my dad said he was happy that I got over my silly Ivy League thing. Looking back, I must have somehow absorbed the skepticism of strangers who would sometimes come up to me in a, in a very condescending way and go, can you count to 10? Do you know your alphabet? What I realized at Brown was that unschooling is a lifelong commitment. It's not a stepping stone to career or college. Unschooling is an ethos. I realized it was my duty to take back the reins of my own education, to get in touch with my inquisitive nature, to set my own standards for engagement and mastery. The difference between educating and credentialing is profound. And if we're talking about a basic high school or college degree, it's worth asking the question, what do academic credentials signify anyway? As I see it, they are a sign that a person can play by the rules and can be managed. John Taylor Gatto, the former New York State Teacher of the Year and taught in public high schools for 30 years, argues that it is not the potential of self-education that has yet to be demonstrated, but that its success has to be suppressed in the service of compulsory education's true purpose. To train young people not to think much at all, because that's what makes them good employees and good consumers. If that's a bit too conspiracy theory for you, please reconsider. Despite their democratic claims, our society's elites have long seen compulsory schooling as a mechanism to contain and control a potentially unruly citizenry. In 1909, Woodrow Wilson put it this way, we want one class of persons to have a liberal education, and we want another class of persons, a very much larger class of necessity in every society to forego the privileges of a liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific and difficult manual tasks. A half century later, Sidney P. Marlin, Commissioner Delegate of Education under Richard Nixon, said, we should view the future generations of learners in America as coming to maturity at a time when society may not require all their intellectual and developed capacities in the workforce. In other words, the economy doesn't need, nor does it have the space for an abundance of developed, self-possessed thinking citizens. And such citizens are just trouble anyway. Men like Marlin and Nixon consider the humanities, which foster critical thinking and political consciousness, a serious threat to social stability, economic productivity, and the status quo. They promoted vocational training and job preparation as the solution. The wisdom presented by writers like A.S. Neal, John Holt, John Taylor Gatto, and others is simple enough that people need less schooling, not more. But today, the answer is always more. More funding, more teachers, more textbooks, more discipline, more class time, more homework, more tests, more standards, more accountability, more authority, more preparation, 
distraction from menial and meaningless work. Since the 1960s, the school day and the academic year have lengthened considerably. The amount of homework assigned to a first grader has more than doubled since 1981. Parents buy baby Einstein programs. They fork over fortunes for private tutors. They hire professionals to coach their kids through the college application process. Schools, meanwhile, have become monumental warehouses holding thousands of students. They're monitored by security guards, by police. They're subjected to an ever-increasing number of standardized tests. To cope, people turn to chemicals. Ritalin, for example, is prescribed to millions of children. But in the 1960s, people believed the system was sick, but now it seems we think our children are. No wonder my parents wanted to help their kids escape from this absurd fate. I'm grateful to them, as you can probably tell. But now that I've sung unschooling's praises, I want to share some of my doubts about it. Jonathan Kozol makes a provocative case against progressive education becoming yet another exclusive realm of the privileged. An isolated, upper-class free school is a great deal too much like a sandbox for children of the SS guards at Auschwitz, he says, with his usual panache. Kozol's contention is not that free schools or unschooling are bad, but that the very populations that are in need of these types of educational opportunities aren't getting access to them. This is a world where the children of an all-black school in St. Louis receive a public education worth 8000 a year, while their white counterparts in Lake Forest receive 18000 For many practical concerns, Trump radical critique. Theoretical conversations about the psychic effect of compulsory schooling kind of seem spurious when the bottom line is it grows often race-based inequality. Others have argued that by sending children to private schools or keeping them at home, parents passively allowing public schools to fall into even greater disrepair in their absence. So what kind of individualism does unschooling promote? A sort of I've got mine mentality. My kids are safe at home being creative. Too bad for everybody else. Or is it an expressive individualism, one that empowers kids to trust themselves, their instincts, their personal learning style? And while I'm pointing out problems, how about gender issues? The people who actually do the unschooling, who stay at home with the kids, are more than often women. The fact is there are many ways that unschooling can reinforce social hierarchies, and these issues have to be discussed. These aren't easy issues to settle because we live in an imperfect world. In many ways, unschooling was a compromise. The more appealing of the only two extremes available to me, I could either stay at home and teach myself, or I could go to public school and have my spirit crushed. What I really wanted, and what I still want, is that intellectual community I was looking for in high school and college and never really found. I would have loved to commune with other young people and to study marine biology or number theory a couple afternoons a week. But for some reason, such a possibility was unthinkable. Instead, the only option was to submit to a rational authority, eight hours a day, five days a week, in a series of cinder block holding cells. We should wonder why there's no middle ground. Often when I talk to people about these issues, they say, unschooling worked for you, but admit that it won't work for everyone. It implies that my family is exceptional, that we're gifted. So, okay, it's kind of a compliment. But on the other hand, it implies that most people are not gifted and that they need to be guided, molded, tested, and inspected. John Taylor Gatto put it this way. After a long life and 30 years in public school trenches, I've concluded that genius is as common as dirt. We suppress our genius only because we haven't yet figured out how to manage a population of educated men and women. We shouldn't forget Wilson, Marlin, and Nixon, powerful politicos who actually engineered academic curriculum to instill lowered expectations and a willingness to settle for less and the students exposed to it. The empowerment that comes from liberal education was something they wanted to reserve for elites like themselves. As someone who actually believes my family was exceptional only in our actions and not in some innate sense, as someone who actually believes genius is as common as dirt, I don't want to reinforce these elitist divisions even inadvertently. Unschooling fundamentally is driven by a profound trust and a human capacity to be curious. The challenge we face and it's a difficult one, is finding a way to extend this trust, to extend this trust, to extend this trust outwards beyond the home and into the public sphere where it is so desperately needed. Thank you very much.